We are an information-rich world. American inventor and visionary Buckminster Fuller created what is called the knowledge doubling curve. He noticed that until 1900, human knowledge doubled approximately every century. By the end of World War II, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Now today things are not as simple since different types of knowledge have different rates of growth. For instance, uh, nanotechnology knowledge doubles every two years. Clinical knowledge doubles every 18 months, while human knowledge is doubling every 13 months. According to IBM, and I love the way they, they, put, they turn this phrase, the build out of the Internet of Things will lead to the doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. The top 10 in-demand jobs in 2010 did not exist in 2004. Think about that. They weren't even a twinkle in some inventor's eye. It's estimated that 40 exabytes of unique information will be generated this year. An exabyte is a unit of information equal to one quintillion bytes, that is 10 to the 18th power, or one billion gigabytes. That's a lot of information. That's, there's more, that's more information generated in this year alone than the previous 5,000 years. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel very overwhelmed. That is a staggering load to carry. We are not just an information-rich society or world, I should say. We are an information-saturated one. I would go as, to far, as far as to say that we are an information-bloated and bogged-down world. And with all the sources of information at our, at our disposal at the click of a mouse, how are we supposed to process it all? Now that is a great question, and I'm not going to answer it directly. There is an answer, and we will find the answer, but we're going to go a little bit of a circuitous route to get there. What I'd like to do is juxtapose that concept of all this information with a phrase that I have heard many times throughout my life. I don't know where this phrase originated. But I know that the novelist Anne Lamott has kind of sort of popularized it. She said, if the devil can't get you to sin, he'll make you busy. If the devil can't get you to sin, he will make you busy. One blogger who was sort of bantering back and forth with Miss Lamott and her, her saying uh, quipped this. She, he said, why is busy such a devilish diversion? Why is busy such a devilish diversion? Why is busy being busy such a bad thing? Well, here's my answer. My answer is because it keeps us from slowing down. It keeps us from stepping back and asking of all the information at my disposal in the midst of all the, the things that cry for my attention, how can I figure out what is most important? How will I know what matters most here? The insane increase of knowledge is yet another sign that we are living in the last days. The series that we're currently in. Is this the last time? Is this the end of times? Well, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 says that when the end times come, people will be traveling to and fro and knowledge will increase. I don't think anyone understood what in the world he meant when he said that back then. And I think we're just beginning. Because as this onslaught of information continues to come at us, it feels like a tidal wave that wipes us out. So much information that we don't even know what to do with all of it. I don't know about you, but I'm a, I'm a type A, anal retentive, obsessive compulsive sort of person. And if there's information out there, I think I ought to know it. I think I ought to have some sort of exposure to it. I ought to be able to handle it. I ought to... And this is overwhelming to me. But I think 
that there is an answer for us. This is week three. As, as we have been in this series on Is This the End Times, and we've been dealing with three great distractions. The first great distraction that we dealt with was as we look at the end times, a lot of people are very concerned. They, they look at the prophecies, they see all the signs that are happening around us, and the prophecies are being fulfilled and the signs are there. But what we end up doing is we end up so focusing on the here and now, what those prophecies are, what those signs are, we end up focusing all of our attention right here, but we forget that all of this determines eternity for ourselves. The decisions we make here, the way we behave here, should be focused on what happens here in all of eternity. The second distraction that we dealt with was last week when we talked about fear and all the different things that we can be afraid of and the things that distract us that, that cause us to, to be scared of what's happening in the world. We saw the solution to that last week was to stop listening to our own voices or every other voice out there and start speaking God's truth to ourselves. Let God tell us what is true. I had an odd thing happen to me this week. I don't know if you've ever done this, but you know, I've been reading in the book of Romans and studying on my personal devotion time this last week. And one of the things that really struck me is I was looking at chapter 2 and 3. Paul points out that, that the issue that we're dealing with is a heart issue. It's not about how you behave. It's about who you are. And who you are causes you to behave in a certain way. And as, as that's just kind of processing in my mind, I, I, I was washing my hands and I looked up in the mirror and it was as if God said to me, Len, you are not who you see reflecting back in the mirror. You are who I see in your heart. I look at this. And I realized that God was helping me speak truth to myself. I don't know about you, but there are things I would change about my physical appearance. You don't need to be so quick to nod and say, yes, I agree. But, if we allow those things to distract us, they will keep us from focusing on who God is and what He is doing inside of us. Now, we looked at just one verse last week, 1 Peter 4, 7. We saw that through our prayer time, through our time with God, instead of listening to our voice, we need to be speaking God's truth to ourselves. But there is some really incredible stuff in verses 8 to 11. And that's where we'll be focusing our attention this morning. The rest of this passage... Peter shows us how to take a step back. How to take a, take a step back. And in this passage, these short verses, he provides us with a filter. A filter that we can use that will help us deal with the 40 exabytes of information that are coming at us like a tidal wave. And if we will do these three things, we will understand what God is saying is most important. Now the passage begins when the end is near. Or because you know the end is near, speak God's truth to yourself rather than listen to your own voice. And then it gives us three keys to undistracted living in these end times, in these last days. In verse 8, Jesus says that we are to love one another deeply. The first way to live an undistracted life during these end times is to love one another deeply. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Above all, love each other deeply. Some of your translations say earnestly. The word could be translated stretched or strained. It was used to describe the taut muscles of an athlete 
who strains to win a race. Jesus' disciples, unselfish love and other-centered concern should be exercised to the point of personal sacrifice, of strain, of, of blood, sweat, and tears. This doesn't always mean the sacrifice of our body. As a matter of fact, he, the, the example he gives us is something different. This kind of sacrifice shows up in the mundane things of life. When he says, love covers over or hides a multitude of sins. This kind of muscle fatiguing, sinew popping, strenuous love is not blind. It sees. It sees clearly and chooses not to expose the sin of another. Love covers over a multitude of sins. The Proverbs say it this way, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Let me be, be clear here. It does not say that love condones or ignores sin. Love covers over sin. There are two ways that love covers over sin. First, if we love someone, we will be grieved that they are hurting themselves and others when they sin. And we will go to them privately. And we will point out to them this, the struggle. Now, before we do that, Jesus said, before you go to talk to your brother or sister with a sin struggle, with a log sticking out of your own eye, get the log out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of their eye. This is not a license for us to go and point out wrongs in people's lives. God did not call me and He did not call you to be a fruit inspector. To look at the fruit of the Spirit in someone else's life and if we don't see it there, we, we let them know. That's not our job. But if we love then we will be grieved when somebody blows it. Because it's not only hurting themselves, it's hurting others. A lot of times we think that if I'm sinning in private, it's not going to impact anybody else, but that's the, the, one of the greatest lies that our society has bought. Just remember a former president who tried to define what is, is. And how that lifestyle impacted not just the political scheme of our, of our country, but the moral scheme of our country. James said this way, Whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 18, the, the passage that tells us how to handle an issue when we've struggled with somebody, when somebody's hurt us, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. For the disciple of Jesus, wrongs done to one another can't be allowed to fester. He also tells us, you know, if somebody's wronged you, you should go to them. But then he also then says later in Matthew 5, earlier in Matthew 5, if you wrong somebody else, then you need to go to them. So let me, let me just say this real clearly. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're, you're a disciple of Jesus, and someone has wronged you, it's not up to them to come to you. It's up to you to go to them in love. And if you have wronged someone else, it is up to you to go to that person. Listen to this passage. It says... Um, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gifts. If your brother has an issue with you and you are aware of it, your worship is worthless. God doesn't want the worship of somebody who knows they've wronged somebody else. The way we worship God is by making it right. God doesn't care about our gifts. He cares about our lives. He cares about us. So whether they're in the wrong or whether you are in the wrong, as followers of Jesus, we need to go 
to one another. We cover sin by confronting sin privately and we cover sin by not broadcasting someone else's sin. We are not to go to someone else about someone's sin so that they can and tell them so they can pray more effectively. The discerning, mature disciple of Jesus should not get any sort of joy in knowing about the struggle someone else has. It ought to be something that we carry with one another. Galatians 6 talks about carry, every person needs to carry, carry our own burdens, but it also talks about every believer carrying the burdens of someone else. One is just a little day pack, the other one is a backpack that is cumbersome and, and overwhelming. So there are things we need to do for ourselves in our walk with Jesus, and there are things that we need others to do. There are some sin struggles that we are dealing with that must have help. And we've got to be there for each other. We need to love each other deeply. If the issue isn't resolved, the sin's not confessed, the sin isn't dealt with, then the rest of Matthew 18, verses 16 to 20, tell us how we're supposed to handle that. What are we supposed to do? I came across just a, a phenomenally appropriate example of this. There was a church in Dallas, Texas called Watermark Church. Watermark Church dealt with a man very privately about a sin struggle that he had. Now this happens to be a, a politically inflammatory sin struggle. In this article and what I'm about to read to you, they never mention the man's name. Matter of fact, this would never have begun gone public if this man hadn't on the one year anniversary of what the church did in his life um, to try to help him with his sin struggle if he hadn't posted that on Facebook. Um, but listen to what uh, Todd Wagner, the pastor of um, Watermark Church said. Recently, one of our former members here at Watermark Community Church shared communications he received from his close friends and church leaders informing him that his membership status had changed because of his desire to actively participate in same-sex relationship. This letter has gained much attention online. Some are confused, even hurt, and I understand why. The practice of church discipline, which is to say loving correction, is a process that is unfamiliar to most because of the harshness and because of the harshness of the word discipline might even be perceived as unloving, oppressive, or archaic. Additionally, homosexuality itself is an area where the larger church has often failed to love well, and many church leaders have unfairly and wrongly made it out to be a larger sin than other more acceptable sins like pride, pornography, materialism, anger, or heterosexual infidelity. Any church that has said homosexual acts are a more significant sin than others have failed Christ and needs to ask forgiveness from both Jesus and those who struggle with the same sex attraction. Following the example of Jesus, Watermark loves and welcomes people of all backgrounds, economic statuses, ethnicities, and sexual struggles. Also, following his example, we encourage people to turn away from sin and to follow Jesus. We have many members and several staff who struggle with same-sex attraction or for whom same-sex sexual activity is a part of their past. We count it a privilege to labor with them in their desire to resist temptation and we rejoice with them as they experience forgiveness and new life in Christ. Their stories are powerful and serve as beautiful testimonies to the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Prior to his membership status being changed, this friend made clear to us that he no longer believed same-sex sexual, same -sex sexual activity was inappropriate for a follower of Jesus Christ and no longer desired to turn from it. Like any member whose beliefs move away from the core commitments biblical convictions and values of Watermark, it became appropriate to formally acknowledge his desire to not pursue faithfulness to Christ with us. When you enter into a formal membership covenant with the church family, the leaders in church community promise to keep watch over your souls, according to Hebrews 13, 17, and will be held accountable before God for their spiritual care and encouragement. This care is a sacred, sacred trust and comes with great responsibility. As members of God's family, we are called to love, admonish, encourage, and help each other in our relationship with Christ. Loving correction, church discipline, 
can be a difficult idea to understand because candidly, though the mandate is clearly explained by Jesus in the Gospels and throughout the New Testament, most churches today completely ignore it. Discipline is an act of love, something any parent knows. The heart of true correction is always to bring about good in the life of an individual. Our goal with every instance of care and correction is to restore the relationship and save our hurting friend from the trouble that sin always creates. We encourage anyone with more questions to look at watermark.org slash statement for an in-depth explanation. We also love to sit with you and answer your questions. You can send them an email and, and answer their question, and they'll answer questions you might have about it, or you can give one of us a call. But we believe Jesus is the hope of the world, and it's the job of the church to hold fast to the truth found only in the Word of God. No sin is greater than another. Jesus died for you. Forgiveness and new life is available to you in Jesus Christ. Now, as you might imagine, the world doesn't get that. That was an editorial piece, an opinion piece, that was published in the Dallas Morning News. And in the Dallas Morning News was an article that I'm not going to take the time to read except for the title. Watermark Megachurch banned a gay man that it, did, that it didn't deserve to have as a member. Sometimes loving deeply can be painful. But the thing I, I appreciate about this is they took a stand biblically. And they also, they never mentioned his name. They didn't want to broadcast this. They did it very privately. They did it within the church. If we're going to live an undistracted life in these end times, we must commit to loving one another deeply. Living in these undistracted times means that God people not only love each other deeply, but verse 9 tells us that we are to show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Look at verse 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Pretty straightforward. Now, hospitality was something that was critical at this time. These people, as, as you might recall, when we started talking about First Peter last week, had been scattered around the then known world. They were far from their homes. They had begun establishing themselves in communities, but there were other believers that were coming to town, and they would have no place to stay. There were itinerant evangelists who would come through, and they would have no place to stay because any other accommodations were either non-existent or very out of their price range, not affordable. And so he was saying, you need to be hospitable to one another. You need to make sure that your love is very practical in opening up your home and, and allowing guests to come in. Our attitude is crucial because how we treat one another, whether we are an open door or a closed door person, speaks volumes to those who are watching us when times get mean. I love how one person turned the phrase, when we find ourselves in the thick of thin things. Grumbling is a complaint uttered in a low, indistinct tone. We might say something we said under our breath. Murmuring. It's a way of acting like everything's okay, but seething on the inside because that seething finds a way of leaking out. Caring for a guest can be inconvenient. Some guests are rather quirky. Sometimes your agenda, your calendar, your schedule has to be accommodated and there are awkward moments. And still, we are to kindly, willingly, genuinely offer to make others welcome in our homes without grumbling. This expression of love is about self-sacrifice. It's about saying, I am going to give to the needs of another without expecting anything in return. It's a service done to Jesus, which another, benefit, another believer benefits from. I want to encourage us, as we continue to see things change in our culture, in our country, this, this is something that we as a church seem to be pretty good at. New people come and they feel very welcome here. But how are we doing with this personally? 
Could it be that God is bringing this to our attention because he wants us to, to be preparing ourselves to be more hospitable to people? I have a couple suggestions on how we might do that. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you in a small way how you can show some hospitality to someone. Someone's had a, a death or someone's had a loss of a job. Somebody's had something negative happen in their lives. Maybe bring them a meal. Maybe let them know that you're praying for them. Be prayerfully in tune with what God's doing as you go through your day. Ask Him, Jesus, is there something that you want to do through me today? Is there some way you want me to open up my heart to somebody? To open up that part of, of who I am to someone today? Pray and ask Him, is there someone that I should invite to use that extra room in my home? Or here's a really practical thing you might do. Go home this afternoon. Look at your closet. If you're anything like me, there have been times not too far in the past where I have said, I have so many clothes, I don't know what to do with them all. Could it be that some of those clothes should have someone else's name on them? Could it be that that you could go through and find some extras to give to someone. Maybe instead of just taking them down to Goodwill or Ark or somewhere like that, ask God, reveal to me someone that I can give these things to. Being hospitable is something that every single one of us can do. Love earnestly. Be happily hospitable. And the third key to undistracted living is found in verses 10 and 11. We are to steward any and every gift that God has given us to service others. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength of God that with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and power forever and ever. Disciples should be diligent in using the gifts and abilities and resources that God has entrusted to us. Each of us is called to serve or to minister. It's the same word translated deacon. The phrase faithfully administering could be translated be a good steward. We're supposed to see ourselves as a steward, see a steward with someone who is in charge of a household. And they didn't have any possessions of their own. They were in charge of the possessions of the house owner. And they were supposed to manage that person, the owner's resources, according to what the owner wanted, according to the owner's will. So our lives as stewards should be with this mindset, God, how do you want me to manage your stuff today? How do you want to use what you've entrusted to me to manage for you today? Whether it's the clothes in our closet, the money in our bank accounts, the time on our calendar. How do you want me to do that? The gift given to you is God's gift of grace, God's expression of grace, for us as a congregation. Every single one of us is a full-time minister. Every one of us. Once we connect with one another and with God, we love Him deeply, then He anticipates and expects that the next part of our discipleship is that we will grow spiritually. And our spiritual growth should show itself in how we treat one another, in how we minister to one another, how we serve one another. Peter divided Christian service into two general categories, the speaking gifts and the serving gifts. It's the, the same distinction that the apostles made in Acts chapter 6. Listen to this passage. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word 
to serve tables. He wasn't saying serving tables is bad and preaching the word is good. He's saying there is this, uh, this a distinction. Both need to happen, and if we do both, then it gets diminished. And this is a great time for, for God to allow us to show that the body, every person in the body has some opportunity to serve. It's not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So here's the point. Every gift is important. And no gift is more important than another. There are times that one gift needs to take preeminence because that's what needs to happen in the body. But there are other times that a different gift does. Are you using your gift? Are you stewarding the gift God has given you? Do you know what your gifts are? Those who exercise speaking gifts, Peter says, should, should do it so that they are, are, are asking God to give him his own words to be spoken. And those who are serving should do it asking Jesus, how would you do this if this were your task to accomplish. I think, I think it goes back to a phrase we've been saying over and over the last few weeks. Jesus, how would you speak? What words would you use if this were your conversation to have right now? Jesus, how would you serve if this were your ministry opportunity right now? Because we've been bought with a price. And so we are to serve God with everything we have and with everything we do. This is a really cool insight that I, I, just blows me away. The word supplies is a word that's used to describe a person who financially supports a chorus, a group of people who get together and sing. So in other words, God underwrites, he provides, he covers the costs, he supplies all, all that, that, that we need so that we can come together in, in all of our voices to sing of God's praise and God's glory. That's why it says all of this, when we do these things, when we live undistracted lives, when we, when we love each other desperately, when we, I can't think of the second thing. Here we go. When we're happily hospitable and when we steward the resources God has given us, then we're saying we're not most important. You are most important to me. And when we say that, we're following Christ's example because that's exactly what he did. And all the praise, all the glory, everything goes to him. In order to not get distracted from what is truly important, if we will use this three-part filter to diffuse the tidal wave of information, it will allow us to focus on the handful of kilobytes that are important and essential to helping us do that. And then with no anxiety, we can allow the rest of the exabytes to exit up into the cloud and not worry, not be anxious. I don't remember where I first heard this, so I, I can't give credit for this insight. But somebody once said, if you look at the world, the result is darkness, chaos, and confusion. If you look within, the result is depression. If you look to Christ, the result is rest. Got this magazine from Denver Seminary, and I thought it was really appropriate to what we're talking about. This is an article written by Marshall Shelley. A church planner was in the Alps watching rock climbers ascend a sheer cliff. There's a first, now there's a first rate commitment to a second rate mission, he said. His statement revealed his bias. He assumed that his mission, church planting, was superior to climbing a rock, opening a franchise, or waiting tables. But no matter our activity, at any particular moment, we can be on a first-rate mission, advancing the gospel and Christ's kingdom. But even when on mission, it's possible to make another unfortunate assumption. The church planner, the planning leader, excuse me, later confessed, I'd given most of my energy to a second-tier mission as well. Don't get me wrong. Church planting is important, but someday that mission will end. My first calling is to live with God. That's something we'll be doing forever. 
abiding with Christ is what enables church planting or evangelism or our work in social justice or acts of compassion done in Jesus' name. The mission of God, reconciling and redeeming and restoring our fallen world, is the focus of your calling and mine. We derive great satisfaction from our work for Christ and His kingdom. The mission of God is second only to our primary calling, to abide in Christ, to live God's presence, to walk in the company of the Spirit, because no branch can bear any fruit apart from Christ. So to live an undistracted life, to live a life that focuses on our first great mission, can happen if we will choose to love deeply, if we will be happily hospitable, and if we will serve and steward the resources we have with one another gladly. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to hear from your word and to know that we don't have to be overwhelmed by all the information that's out there. We can come to you and focus on three simple things and you will help us cut through all the information that's coming at us. Lord, help each and every one of us to love each other deeply. To be good stewards of the resources that you have given to us to bring glory and honor and praise to you. In Jesus' name.